Hello, my name is Duralene Edgar, and I'm the author of this book, Car Suspension Over 120 Years of Ride and Handling. What I want to cover in today's video is the mastery of hydroelastic suspension. Hydro what? I think it's probably the best and most ingenious suspension system ever fitted to passenger cars. So let's take a look at why I say that. Well, Hydroelastic was a compact suspension design. Now that's important because you want to have room in passenger cars for engine, for luggage, for people. And obviously if you have a very bulky suspension system, it's detracting from the space available for those other aspects. Hydroelastic was low in cost. And that's critical in the real world. It's easy to come up with a suspension system that's so expensive it can be fitted only to luxury cars. But Hydroelastic was cheap enough to be fitted to everyday cars. Hydroelastic used front rear interconnection. Now that's especially significant because it can reduce car pitch. Pitch is where the front of the car is going up and the back of the car is going down, or the back of the car is going up and the front of the car is going down, and the car's seesawing like that down the road. And pitch is really, really discombobulating for ride comfort. It really affects it. Hydroelastic had inbuilt variable spring rate. As deflection went up in compression, the spring rate increased. It got progressively stiffer. Uh, it, it wasn't just uh, like a normal steel spring, which is basically linear in rate, unless it's a special, special steel spring. And get this, Hydroelastic had a variable damping rate built into it. Now that meant that when the car was heavily laden, damping was automatically stronger than when the car didn't have so much load. And these days, you look at cars going down the road, you can almost tell by glancing at them how much load they've got on board because you can see the damping is effectively so much softer when they're heavily laden. Hydroelastic automatically took that into account. And as I've written down the bottom of this slide, it was fitted to millions of cars. It wasn't a theoretical system. It was a system that was successful in the marketplace. Now, what cars was it fitted to? Well, the British Motor Corporation, cars of the 1960s, the Austin 1800, the Austin Mini in its wet mode. The Austin Mini also had a what was now called a dry suspension, not a hydroelastic, but it was fitted in hydroelastic form to the Mini. It was fitted to the Morris 1100, and it was even fitted to the Austin 3 litre. This car down the bottom right, a relatively rare car, which also had self-leveling built in, something I, I touch on in the book. Now, <clears throat> up the top right, we have a picture of a man who I think is a genius. He was born in 1920, he died in 2012. His name was Alex Moulton, and he was responsible for the design and development of hydroelastic suspension. I've pictured him with one of his bicycles because he also did some extraordinary designs of bikes. I have two of those small wheeled bikes. They also incorporate a suspension, but that's going to be covered in another video. So Alex Moulton and his company developed Hydroelastic. He had the ear of BMC designers and they agreed to use the suspension system in their cars. Uh, it was widely regarded at the time as innovative, as extraordinarily effective. Um, it was contrasted often and compared often with Citroen's hydropneumatic system, but the Citroen system was vastly more expensive and complex to build. All right, so what did this hydroelastic system actually consist of? Well, here's the rear suspension of the Austin 1800. And I want you to look at a few aspects. Firstly, it's got what's called a very high motion ratio. Now that means that the spring moves only a small distance in compression when the wheel moves a bigger distance. Okay, the ratio of those two, uh, those two movements. And if we look here, the hydroelastic 1800 had uh, trailing rear arm suspension, directly trailing. There's the pivot point. And you can see with the length of that part of the lever versus that part of the lever, the actual compression of the spring, and these are the spring units called displacers, the actual compression of the spring was quite small. Now, having a high motion ratio has actually got some disadvantages. Okay, it's in a, in a normal car, it's harder to damp, and the stresses and strains in the suspension are a lot higher. But in hydroelastic, the high motion ratio was, was, was sort of more than made up for in terms of it being very, very compact, um, it, it is a very compact design. You can see it's basically intruding almost nothing into the uh, car's bodywork, into the interior, and it uh, was very, very effective. Now, another thing to look at is it's an independent suspension design. Uh, we have an anti-roll bar connecting them here, but there's no solid axle or anything like that. 
you got to remember, we're talking about the 1960s, where independent rear suspension was relatively rare on cars. So all hydroelastic cars were independent, both front and back, compact, and part of that compactness explained by the very high motion ratio. But here is the heart of the system, or in fact, four hearts, one for each wheel. Now, it's worth pausing and having a really good look at this. This is the suspension displacer unit, which incorporates both a spring and a damper and the means for the interconnection. Wow. OK, so let's start down the bottom. So down here, we have a rod which is connected to the suspension. And as the suspension rises, as it goes over a bump, this rod rises as well. The rod operates a rubber diaphragm. Okay, a rubber diaphragm, a little bit like uh, the, the diaphragm you find in a modern air spring. But on the other side of the diaphragm, here, where I'm showing with the mouse, there wasn't air, there was actually fluid. And that fluid comprised water and alcohol. Okay, and a embittering agent, so no one tried to drink the alcohol. Now, the alcohol was there as an antifreeze. So what did the water do? Well, it got displaced, it got moved upwards as the diaphragm moved upwards. And it passed through this valve here and this valve here. And these are the damper valves. And all they comprise are holes with a rubber uh, bush over the top held in place by spring leaves. And so the rubber actually flexed upwards against the spring leaves, uh, causing a restriction to the fluid movement. So the dampers are actually built into the middle of the displacers. So the water we'll call it water, passed through the damper valves. And what did it do then? Well, it started to exert a pressure on this bit here. And that bit there is a rubber cone spring, okay? A specially shaped piece of rubber. And you can see here's the area where the fluid was bearing and here's the area here. Now, the rubber deflected in both shear and compression and so gave a reasonably flexible result, much more so than if you were just compressing the rubber uh, without, with no shear, shear movement at all. So we have a compact assembly, literally about that big. It incorporates a spring. It incorporates dampers. It incorporates uh, also, from what we can see here, changes in spring rate as the uh, spring goes through its full motion, something I'll come back to in a moment. Now, what you see on screen was completely invented by Moulton and his company. There is nothing like that in any other suspension design I have ever seen. So he came up with this idea literally from scratch. And that's one of the most extraordinary aspects of the suspension system. If you look at other suspensions, they're minor changes, you know, minor changes in linkages or minor changes in springs or something like that. But this is a completely new idea extraordinary and, and even more extraordinary that it was so successful in terms of the cars it was fitted to. All right, let's look in more detail now at how it all actually works. So the first thing to take on board is there was a hose that came out of the top of that displacer unit and it connects to a small bore pipe which connects to the displacer unit at the other end of the car. So when the front of the car goes over a bump and the front rises, fluid gets transferred to the back pushes the rear suspension down, extending the rear suspension, and so the car does not pitch. It doesn't do this that we talked about earlier. It rides far more levelly. And in fact, if you ride in a hydroelastic car, I've owned one, and I'll come back to that later, the car tends to heave. It tends to go up and down like that, staying level rather than pitching violently. Now, Moulton, and I cover this in detail in my book, uh, he, he was inspired by the Citroen 2CV and its interconnection that I cover in another video. But he said, you know, using mechanical links, as the Citroen does, uh, seems so basic. Uh, why don't we go the way of, of clutches and brakes, which replaced rods and levers with a fluid interconnection? And that's where this uh, idea started to uh, come about. So it's fluid interconnected front rear to reduce pitch. Now, if we look at this, and here's a more detailed diagram, this is the Austin 1800. So it's got double wishbone front suspension, it's got semi-trailing rear suspension. If we look here, we can see as the front suspension rises, we can see from that length there versus that length there, it has a very high motion ratio. We know that the diaphragm gets compressed, in this case towards the right. We know the fluid then flows through the damper valve and deflects the spring, 
which gives it your spring right but you can see the fluid also passes down here passes uh, through the damper valve again so even pitch is damped notice that and then it deflects the diaphragm which then in fact pushes the rear suspension down now the more you look at hydroelastic the more innovative it is in its complexity so not only are bump motions damped but pitch motions are damped as well very very interesting now here's a morris 1100 uh, we can see it's the same uh, sort of system, sim similar hydroelastic. There's your interconnecting pipes front rear. Now, first thing about those is under braking, of course, the car will want to pitch, but it's limited in its pitch acceleration, uh, how fast it can pitch, not only by the damping of pitch, but also by the diameter of these interconnecting pipes because they cause a restriction to flow. All of these things are working together. It's not a simple system. It's complex in its interrelationships as well as its fundamental design. And the Morris 1100 also runs pitch bars, which are torsion steel springs that connect the suspension to the body, which also changes the rate at which the car can actually pitch. Now, if we look at this, and I'm not going to go into this in huge detail, again this is Morris 1100, we can see a few things. So if we look here at the rear suspension, here is wheel deflection, that's in uh, extension and that's in bump, so plus minus two inches shown on this, uh, uh, this particular graph. We can see this solid line is the bounce rate, in other words the spring rate at the wheel, 137 pounds force per inch. But we can see here's the pitch rate, and the pitch rate is only 76 pounds per inch. So it's much softer in pitch, therefore it has a lower pitch frequency than bounce frequency. Quite extraordinary. Now, there's even more complexity because there's what's called a drop angle. The suspension actually changes in its leverage ratio as it moves through its, uh, its motion. And so we have other aspects affecting it as well. Okay, people, uh, I think, often don't understand a lot of these implications. They look at it and go, oh, yeah, whatever. But, but there's so much that's, that's occurring within this system. So that's the rear, uh, rear of the suspension of this car. Bounce rate, much stiffer than pitch rate. And here is the front deflection. You can see there's a slightly different curve. And look how it rises in rate as you get towards uh, full, full bump. Bounce rate of 164 pounds per inch. Pitch rate, again, very, very low, only 74 pounds per inch. And incidentally, there's your motion ratio. It's 4.4 to 1, very high, uh, nearly 4 to 1, 3.95 to 1. Uh, again, part of uh, also taking into account that the rubber spring didn't have a lot of deflection or movement. It's only ever going to deflect a small amount, so we need to uh, increase that dramatically for the, the wheel movement, have a high motion ratio. Now... Take a look at what I've just been describing. And here's the Austin 1800 with transverse displacers that are across the firewall. Hydroelastic has no pumps. There's no pump in any of this system. There's no engine driven pump. A pump was used to pressurize the fluid in the system, which also set the ride height. It was set in maintenance, set at the factory. Um, people could set their own ride heights if they had their own pumps and it was literally only a pump. There are no sliding seals. Think of a hydraulic cylinder which has a sliding seal in it. The, the design of the displacer with the rubber diaphragm moving, there was no sliding contacts. And so, you know, the, 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 the whole idea of things wearing out through sliding through friction didn't apply. There weren't any hydraulic cil cylinders, compare that with, say, uh, the Citroen hydropneumatic system. It therefore was a relatively low cost system and there are some uh, studies that actually show it was cheaper than the equivalent conventional suspension and the fact it had all these advantages means it could, could be productionized. <clears throat> It was actually put into production in millions of cars. And to me, that's one of the indicative things of a successful suspension system that it actually was fitted to lots and lots of cars. As I said earlier, anyone can come up with designs that are expensive, complex, difficult, and could never actually be put into production. But this is a system that had all these advantages and yet was used in many, many cars. Now, this is a car I once owned, an Austin 1800. Uh, extraordinarily interesting car, huge interior space, the front uh, engine, front uh, front wheel drive and the engine was uh, uh, transverse with the, the uh, gearbox and the sump like a Mini 
just enormous interior space, just uh, most space efficient car I think I've ever been in. A superb ride. When I say superb ride, people think, oh, what, for that time? No, superb ride in any context. You know, as good, I would suggest, as, say, a current air suspension Mercedes. In fact, I, in fact, I think it's some type ways better. So absolutely superb ride. Good handling. Now, that is good handling for the time, okay? Fairly high-profile tyres, um, front bias weight, uh, certainly an understeerer, um, but get it flowing along a road, and you could be very, very quick point-to-point. -point. Look, basic engine. Uh, B, B series, I think it was called. Uh, uh, I, I never thought much of the engine. I think a Fiat twin cam would have been far, far better. Uh, really basic engine, noisy, harsh, not very powerful. And of course, poor aerodynamics, terrible aerodynamics. But let's go back. Huge interior space, superb ride, very good handling. And that was coming. Those things were coming from the design of the suspension. Amazing system. The more you look, the more you study it, the more you think about it, you more, the more the subtleties of its, its innovation actually start to come through. These days, why don't we use something similar? Well, with a little bit of electronic control, you could make it even so much better. You could have electronic valving for the interconnection front rear. There's just so much you could now do. Uh, later, they replaced the rubber uh, with gas spheres, a bit like a Citroen, uh, and, and uh, therefore didn't even have the problems of the rubber in terms of small amounts of deflection. And certainly uh, hydro gas, as it was called, I think could be fitted to cars currently. I, I don't see any disadvantages. Of course, it doesn't have to be trailing arms. It doesn't have to be double wishbones. It's the, it's the spring, it's the displacer, which is the innovative part of the system. And that's actually not tied to a particular suspension geometry. It's all in the book, Car Suspension, over 120 years of ride and handling. I cover in detail hydroelastic. And uh, I, I really, really think if you're interested in suspension, that's a system to go and look at and really think about, especially things like the variable damping with load, the interconnection front rear, and the fact that the damping is built into the suspension unit. Thank you.